Hello, I'm Doug White. Welcome to NBC 10 Biographies. In this episode, we will meet two individuals with very different lives, but both broke barriers and made history. John Pastore was the first Italian-American elected to the Senate in the history of the United States. Roger E. Thompson became the first African-American woman on the Rhode Island Superior Court bench. We begin this edition of NBC 10 Biographies with John O. Pastore. This is something that can happen in America alone. I am a first-generation Native American of immigrant parents who came to this great land at the turn of the century. God bless America. Giovanni Orlando Pastore was born in 1907. His father died when he was just nine years old. His mother worked as a seamstress to support the family. He attended classical high school and graduated with honors. Pastore earned a law degree and set up his own practice. In 1941, he married Elena Cato. Together, they would raise three children. His interests turned to politics. He was elected to the General Assembly and later to the post of Lieutenant Governor. In 1945, Pastore was thrust into the state's highest office when Governor Howard McGrath accepted the position of United States Solicitor General. Pastore ran for governor in the next election and won by a narrow margin. But it was a precedent-setting victory. He became the first Italian-American ever elected governor. Fate, fortune, and courage had propelled him to this destiny. He accepted the honor with dignity and humility. These inaugural exercises mark the beginning of another chapter in the proud history of our state government. He broke barriers. He had the energy and the guts to do that, the determination. Um, he also had a tremendous amount of luck. Uh, now, we, we may call that a sense of political timing. <laughs> the only Democrat elected governor in New England that year, Pastore launched a progressive administration. Ignoring skeptics, he made a bid for the United States Senate. Once again, he scored a surprising victory. Flush with success, he was off to the nation's capital to face new challenges. Pastore joined the 82nd Congress as the first Italian-American senator in the history of the nation. He cut himself a certain persona, the smallest senator from the smallest state, and the biggest voice. Over the next 26 years, he would serve as chairman on several important committees. He gained the faith and trust of fellow congressmen and presidents. News of Kennedy's assassination shocked America. Pastore was stunned. Massachusetts and Rhode Island have many problems in common. One of the most heartening efforts to meet these problems has been the devoted work of Senator John Pastore of Rhode Island. As the nation mourned, the senator from Rhode Island arrived at the White House to pay his respects to a fallen hero. The signing of the Civil Rights Bill was a tremendous achievement for President Johnson. Behind the scenes, John O. Pastore had fought hard for passage of this hotly debated law. He's an unsung hero who should get much more singing, I think. He saw himself in all oppressed people, or all people discriminated against. Uh, we uh, have lost a battle, of course, but we are not yet ready to surrender. Pastore had clashed with Southern legislators in the battle for civil rights, but he was fearless on the floor of the Senate. As a young uh, boy going to Washington, I would sometimes wait when he was chairing a committee, and he was very tough. I mean, it's almost unrecognizable to me, very mild, benign father, you know, who never raised his voice to me that I can remember. But in committee, he was a tiger. The American people is disturbed about this violence, and we have some very serious constitutional questions. It's gone too far, absolutely too far. When the committee broke up, uh, I was a little worried about going up to my father. <laughs> you know, you don't know, is this going to carry over? And uh, he came up to me and smiled broadly. He said, come on, Johnny, let's go to dinner. You know, and that was it. I mean, he never, you know, you'd never think that he had he'd just torn into this guy. The election of 1964 approached. What role might Pastore play? 
Beyond all this hoopla, of course, is the serious business of writing a plank, outlining Democratic aims, and choosing a vice presidential candidate. Inside information seems to put Senator Hubert Humphrey of Minnesota in the front-running position. Mr. Johnson is also said to be considering Senator Eugene McCarthy of Minnesota. Word that McCarthy believed he would be chosen as vice president reached the White House. Johnson, always mindful of his place in history, secretly recorded many of his phone conversations. He insisted that his choice for vice president remained open. There's four or five people being very, very seriously considered. And one of them is McCarthy. And one of them is Upton. And one of them is Pastore. LBJ chose Humphrey for his running mate. But he had not forgotten his old friend from his days in the Senate. The only test, I think, that you've ever applied is what's good for America is good for you. Pastore would play a crucial role in the convention. Weeks earlier, the president called with a request that left Rhode Island Senator almost speechless. Johnny? Yes? How are you? Fine, Mr. President. How are you? Say, Johnny, uh, I thought we might uh, ask you to make a speech for us at the convention. Well, what do you mean? We need a good keynote, and we thought maybe you would uh, fit in pretty well at it. Well, I'd be honored to. I want it to be the best one that's ever made. I think you can show uh, by what you say and the way you handle yourself uh, what our party stands for, and uh, yeah. most of all, uh, everybody will be thinking what great opportunity we got in this country when you can be senator and I can be president. I'll do the best I can. God bless you. Pastore did his best. The speech was spellbinding. When we go forth from this great city, it will be with a platform that speaks in language that is powerful, but language that is plain. We must speak of the facts of life as they are. We will move forward in decency and in dignity. And Johnson called him up and said, Johnny, he said, I knew you were going to be good, but I didn't know you were going to be that good. Johnson won by a landslide, but his administration brought trouble to supporters like Pastore. NBC 10 biographies will return in a moment. American involvement in Vietnam escalated rapidly under President Johnson. Supporters of the president, like Senator Pastore, were pulled deeper into the quagmire. He found himself under increasing pressure to be a patriotic loyalist uh, in that period. And the terms of the patriotism were written by the Johnson administration. We argued a lot about whether uh, authority should be respected as much as he was respecting it. And, um, you know, we had a different take on that, representing different generations. Um, but it, it, didn't, it didn't go far enough, thank God, to destroy our relationship. I know this is By 1969, even Pastore began losing patience. We've been engaged there now for years and years and years. And our, our young men are dying. And you have this the rebellion on the campuses, you have this dissatisfaction on the part of the people. We're not meeting our priorities here at home. We haven't uh, sufficient housing for the elderly. We are not doing enough for poverty. These are important problems here at home, and we have to put our own home and, and house in order. In 1970, a renegade priest, who later went on to become a right-wing talk show host, challenged Pastore. John McLaughlin launched an aggressive campaign for the Senate. As a devout Catholic, and a true believer, I mean, he really uh, was a good Catholic, to run against a priest in a kind of rock'em sock'em political contest, I think he hated the experience. Mr. Pastore's record is more than a matter of omission. Some of his voting has actively harmed the people of this state. McLaughlin is a no holds barred, say anything, lie, cheat, whatever you can do, and do it in the hardest, toughest way possible type of political infighter, and um, Pastore was a tough infighter, but not like that. Your opponent has called upon you to treat him as a man, man to man in this campaign, and I think he put it John to John. 
The point is that as long as I'm in the Senate of the United States, I'm a senator. As long as he's a priest, he's a priest. And I mean, it would be an awkward situation for me to be viewed in public addressing a man as John when he's actually a priest and everyone knows it. It was a time of uh, some bitterness. I mean, I think there are very few things about which my dad was angry or bitter in politics, but, um, but I think he did not at all enjoy that campaign. And uh, I think he was running against uh, an opponent who was both insulting and yet insulated and protected uh, by the Roman collar. Pastore won the election by a landslide, but the contentious campaign had taken its toll. The scene, Capitol Hill in Washington. The subject, broadcasting. And the senator, John O. Pastore of Rhode Island. Pastore strongly supported public television, but his battles with the commercial networks were legendary. Pastore was always a family man. He believed that any family ought to be able to have its children sit in front of the television sets. Uh, and he said that with no holds barred. You see, this argument, this nonsensical argument, if you don't like it, you shut it off. Well, at the time you get around to shutting it off, you've already seen it. Well, of course. And your children have already seen it. Critics accused him of advocating censorship. Comedians ridiculed his ideas. The reason, the reason I'm calling, sir, I wanted to ask you about Senator Pass' story and whether or not... Past story. My dad's uh, take on that was always that the fight was worth that, that it was worth taking the shots. And if the Smothers Brothers were going to give you their best shot in the opening monologue, but if you believed uh, that children watching television had to be protected to some extent, uh, then the fight was worth it. Pastore balanced a public and private life for over 40 years. In 1976, he made the difficult decision not to seek re-election. I think he knew that uh, a historic period had ended and that the next one would not be quite as pretty. This great city, Washington, stands for power and influence and at times great scandal. And it's important to remember that when John Pastore goes home, he'll leave with the honor and the respect of his staff and colleagues and the people who sent him here 25 years ago. Pastore's legislative experience was worth a fortune, but he refused to cash in on it. He said, uh, Johnny, he said, the one thing I'm not going to do is to go into somebody's office with my hat in hand and trade on my Senate career. Now there would be time for grandchildren, time for his beloved Elena, and time to continue his crusade against the greatest threat to mankind. For if an all out atomic war ever comes, please understand, please understand, that every home, every kitchen, every cradle could well become a cemetery. This person really was the defender uh, of the weak and of the disadvantaged and felt that very deeply, probably because of his own humble background. He never lost touch with ordinary people and he had a great affection uh, and a respect uh, for people who were not very highly placed in life. And that was not a show, that was real. The life of Roger E. Thompson, next on NBC 10 Biographies. Ojeda Roger E. Thompson was born in Greenville, South Carolina in 1951. Her parents, Sarah and Wendell Thompson, were school teachers. She was the descendant of both slave owners and slaves. Her great-grandfather, Jacob Bedenboe, bought her great-grandmother at a slave auction. The NAACP made this film in the 1930s when segregation was the law of the land. It contrasts the education provided for white students in South Carolina against the grim realities faced by blacks. The film is a stark reminder of a time when society was split into two parts, separate and unequal. I remember when I was teaching, I had to go to Positola to get books. You couldn't go in the front door. I had to go in the side door. And they would issue you these books, and they would be old books, be stamped in there such and such a time. And uh, we'd bring them on out and, you know, Use them, had to use them. 
primera voz me dijo, Thompson's father was a high school principal. He was really a, a kind of a no-nonsense uh, administrator. Um, he expected and got, uh, you know, respect from the student body and from the faculty. I mean, he was the man. Wendell Holmes Thompson died when his daughter was just eight years old. It was tough for her. She was eight. I remember her screaming, so you know when you told her father had paid. Thompson excelled in grammar school and at the segregated high school that she attended for two years. In the 60s, trouble erupted in many American cities as long simmering racial tensions sparked riots. Many programs were launched to improve race relations. Thompson enrolled in one that would take her far from Greenville, South Carolina. She would spend the next two years in a nearly all-white high school in Scarsdale, a wealthy suburb in New York. The goal of the program was to provide young blacks with a better education and expose them to a different environment. Don and Jane Johnston would act as her foster parents. Their family welcomed her into their home without concern for local reaction. There probably was some questions in the minds of some of our neighbors <laughs> who were kind of quite conservative yes. um, and, and you know we're Republican and we were Democrat oh, and, yes, and we, were Democrat. we drove a Volkswagen bus they drove a big that sort of thing <laughs> uh, but they never really said anything to us. The only thing I was ever concerned about with having Roger there was, would, was that she might be exploited in other words you know it was a community that was doing its best to show how liberal it was, and I didn't want them using her as, you know, here's our token to show how liberal we were. Scarsdale was a peaceful community, but America was in a time of sudden and violent change. Like anybody, I would like to live. Martin Luther King Jr. was killed tonight in Memphis, Tennessee. She was really devastated. I mean, it didn't hit us the same way emotionally. For us, you know, like this was, you know, a problem would have to be solved to continue the civil rights movement. But I think for her, it was much more emotional. For teenagers, transformation is a part of life. She and our daughter went into the bedroom with a ruler and a pair of scissors. She came out and she had this gorgeous afro, just beautiful. Scarsdale's newest resident hadn't made up her mind. She would meet the world on her own terms. Thompson applied and was accepted at Brown University. Her arrival made an impression on both students and faculty. First of all, terrifically good looking. Disarmingly so. That is to say there's a softness about her which is disarming because a lot of people see cosmetically softness, a certain kind of beauty, and they see weakness, and that is not what she has. She's got backbone. Despite the upheaval of the 60s, there was a strong conservative element at Brown and other campuses across the nation. Arthur Schlesinger said yesterday in the New York Times, Mr. Buckley, that Cornell University erred in giving in to the demands of armed Negro militants. Uh, would you prescribe to... I'm out of the mouth of babes. <laughs> African-American students at Brown began to demand changes in the curriculum. They wanted uh, an independent uh, black studies program. And what independent means is something which had a certain kind of autonomy equal to any other department on the campus. Ideas which were, I'll, I'll just call them revolutionary. The people that initiated that were black students. And Marjorie was in the front line. She also had a judicious quality and a sense of fairness few students had. She was willing to listen. She was a great peacemaker. And I think that's why she's a judge now. You know, she had these qualities when she was a student. After graduating from Brown, Thompson earned a law degree at Boston University. She practiced law over the next 14 years before being selected for the role of district court judge. I stand here filled with a sense of joy and pride. Thompson married William Clifton, a prominent lawyer. Together, they began raising a family. In 1997, she was chosen from a select group of candidates for the prestigious position of Superior Court Judge. It was a proud moment for Rogerie Thompson and her family. 
But her success came as no surprise to those whose lives she has touched. She just always been the, one of those achievers. It's a great achievement, had to do right. <laughs> She's one of the finest role models, I think, and it's important that, that young people look at her and see what she represents. A person with that kind of confidence is going to go far. I mean, I expect she'll go farther. She will write opinions. There will be certain things that she will do in the process of being a judge that will become part of the literature and will affect all of us, whether we know it or not. NBC 10 Biographies will return in a moment. Thank you for being with us. I'm Doug White. Be sure to join us next time for another edition of NBC 10 Biography.